Hello and welcome to the fourth data visualization project. So in this one, we're going to be creating a choropleth map. And now what that is, is if you look at the Wikipedia page, it's a type of map where areas are shaded or patterned in proportion to some data about that area. So we have to build a code pen app that looks like this. So what it is, is a map of the USA and it shows some data about the education levels and as you can see the colors change depending on some data and to do this we have these two pieces of data so the first one is US education data and that has a list of counties and just some information about what percentage of people there have a bachelor's degree or higher and the second array that we have is um, the county data and this has some instructions on how we can draw some lines to recreate the shape of that county to create a map and that's what we'll be using to create our elements here. So if we take a look at what I've just done I've created a skeleton project so I have index.html here and that has d3 imported. Now this piece of data here the county's data is it says type topology so that means it's, it's a type of data called topo JSON, and that's a kind of JSON format that's used to store information about like geographic or geometrical data about for maps and stuff so what if you just search for topo JSON cloudflare and then from cd and js you can just copy this link to import it and we do need to import it so that's just what i've done right here I've given it a title, I've created an SVG with an ID of canvas, so that's where we'll draw our map. I've created my own script tag, and then I've also imported the test suite so we can do the testing. In style.css, I've just set the minimum height of body in HTML to take up 100% of the height of the display, put some flex display on to just to send to the SVG canvas, given it a small background color, and then set the size to 1000 by 600 and also in the script tag what I've just done is I've console.log to d3 and topo json just to make sure we've imported it correctly so what I'm going to do now is just open this up with live server and if you have a look now we have the test suite right here we have our svg canvas to work with and if we just take a look at the console we can see that we have all the D3 methods and all the topo JSON methods. So now we can get started. So now I'm quickly just going to introduce you to the structure of our code. And what I have is I've just created these two string variables right here. So county URL just stores the county data, this one right here. So it's just the address of that. And then education URL just stores the address of this education data. Now I also have two variables, county field and education, county data, sorry, and education data. And what this will do is once we fetch these resources, it's going to create an array of the objects that we need, which we can give to D3 to draw the map on the canvas and set the attributes. This canvas right here is just a D3 selection of this SVG ID equals canvas so that we can just simply reference it using the variable name canvas. Finally, this function draw map is where we'll be actually drawing the map using the data and we can run this function when we've imported everything and we are ready to go. So now what we're going to do is look at actually importing this JSON data into our app right here so that we can start using it. Now, I'm not going to use an XML HTTP request this time. I'm going to use D3's own JSON own JSON method and I'm going to show you how that works. So you call it by saying d3.json and what you do is into this you give it a URL of the data you want to import. So I'm just going to give it the URL to our county JSON object. Remember that just references this and what this does is it actually returns a promise. So we need to give it a function to run once that this has been completed and the promise has been resolved. So we'll use the dot then method to specify a function. And this function will take in two things. So it'll take in the data, so that'll be whatever the response 
text or whatever it was. And D3 will automatically convert the JSON string into a JavaScript object for us. So we don't have to worry about doing that. And also it'll take in an error if there was an error. And what we want to do is if there was an error, we want to log the error so we can understand what happened. And then if we didn't have an error, what I can do is remember D3 will convert the JSON string that it receives from the source, so this, into a JavaScript object, which is this data right here. And we want to set this to this variable right here. So I'm just going to say let count, sorry, I don't need the let. I'm just going to assign county data to this data right here. And I'm also just going to log that to make sure we have received it correctly. So if we save that now and have a look, we can see that this JSON data right here has been imported by D3. And we have it now as a JavaScript object that we can use. So now we need to import the other piece of data, the education data, and that's this right here. And um, because this is an asynchronous function and we want the code to be in a specific order, I want the education data to be imported after this is imported. So remember that this whatever is inside this else statement runs after this promise has been resolved. So this is where we want to um, fetch the education data. So again, I'm going to call the d3.json method. So once this uh, county data has been fetched, we're going to call this method. And this time we want to give it the education URL. And once again, we'll call dot then to specify a function. And this function once again takes in data and error. And if error, we just want to console log it. And if there wasn't an error, so else. And uh, this time we fetch the, so D3 has fetched the education data as a JSON string, converted it to a JavaScript object and set it as this data right here. So we can just set education data, our variable right there to data. And these two, now that we've set them here, but we declare them here, we can use them in this draw map function. So I've just set the education data right there. So I'm just going to console.log that as well. So if we save that now and have a look, we have education data, which is this right here. And it's been converted into a JavaScript array of county objects that we can actually use. So what we essentially done is use the d3.json method to fetch and convert these sets of data into a JavaScript object. So now is probably the most difficult part of the project. And that's figuring out how we can use this data right here to create these maps. So what these county objects are actually created from are SVG paths. And what they are are just a set of lines and coordinates that are drawn onto the canvas and they can be used to create more advanced shapes like these. So we need to create a path for each of these county objects so we can draw them into our map like this. So the data we get back, this topo JSON, can be really confusing because it's got a lot of information right here. So even I'm going to keep having to refer to my notes to understand this. So we have a set of arcs here. So these arcs are just an array of like the coordinates that the um, lines will be drawn between. And uh, we also have this objects field with this counties field. Because this can top uh, top adjacent stores data about nations, states, and counties. We're only interested in this counties field, and what this has is for each county. If we have a look here, it's going to create a polygon, which is just a shape, and each county has an ID, and it has an array of arcs. So these arrays, these references right here, references the arcs in here. I remember these arcs are just a set of points to draw lines between. So each each county right here has this array called arcs, which we will use to draw the lines needed to create that shape on the map. So D this is in top of JSON format, but D3 actually requires it to be in a format called GeoJSON. So if we just have a look at that, 
Um, GeoJSON is another one of these formats. It, it's not as advanced as TopoJSON. So what we just have is essentially a set of coordinates and then some properties. So we need to convert this into, firstly, into GeoJSON format. So we can actually look at implementing this with D3. So to do this, when we've exported this county data right here, we need to call a method. So called a uh, top adjacent feature method. So I'll show you how this works. So what we have to do instead is where we set the data right here, we say topojson.feature. And this is a method that converts topojson objects into geojson, which we can actually use. And into this method, we give it two arguments. So the first is the actual, like, I guess, the data. And remember, we received the data set in the form of just, if we look at this function, it arrives as data. So we can just call the function, um, we can just give it data as the first argument. So this, the first argument is just whatever, like top or JSON object we want. And the second argument is actually what we want to extract out of it or where the key information is. And if we look at the console, the key information we want is in objects. So it's in objects and then counties. So. I'm just going to double check this right here. Yeah, so we want to give it as a second argument data dot objects dot counties like this. And now what this will do is it'll convert this data that we receive into GeoJSON and set it as county data right here. So we're going to have a look at how it changes. So now we have this in GeoJSON format. And the way you know that is GeoJSON consists of these types called feature. And these have, this is a feature collection. So we have an array of features right here. And now what we have instead is we have an array of objects for each state. Look, if we look here, we can see that the ID has been transferred over as well. So they have a unique ID again. And they have this field called geometry, which contains the an array of coordinates between which we can draw lines to create the shape of that county. So this is in GeoJSON format now. The final thing we need to look at is the fact that when we call the dot data method in D3 to bind a set of a set of elements to data, we have to give it an array, and we have this GeoJSON object right here, but we just we're only interested in this features array right here because this this type is not really important. So one final tweak we can make is we can just select the dot features from this. So again, we convert to GeoJSON and then set the features array of that to county data. So if I save that now, we actually have a set of just GeoJSON objects that have a set of coordinates to draw lines from so we can create these shapes for our states. And these coordinates are actually the coordinates on the canvas. So we don't have to worry about actually placing the shapes. The line, it just literally tells you exactly where to draw each line to create the shapes of the states. So it should all line up correctly. If we look at the second array, which is the education data, we can see that the objects all have an area name, a um, percentage of people who are bachelors or higher, this thing called a FIPS and the state. So this FIPS county code, if I just show you now, FIPS county code is a type of um, information, like it's a type, it's a kind of like a way of categorizing county codes that they use in the United States. and. And the important thing to note here is we have three, now we have 3,142 objects in both arrays. So we're working with 3,142 states. And in each of these um, county like map data stuff, we have this ID and they match with these FIPS codes right here. So we can start associating these shapes that we draw with some education data right here. I'm just going to check if there's anything else we need to do now. So yeah, what we essentially have now is two actual arrays that we can call the data method on to actually set 
to draw stuff onto the map and set the attributes. This will become a lot clearer once we actually start drawing the map. So now that we have these two arrays with the data we want, we can finally get started on drawing our map and starting to fulfill these user stories. So if we look at user story one, what it says is we should have a title with the ID of title. So this one is very simple to do. All you have to do is in your document anywhere, we can just create a tag with an ID of title, like they said, and it just puts some text. You don't even have to put the text, so I'm just gonna put USA education data like this. And if I save that now, uh, we can see that we have this title right here and we have an element with an ID of title. So if I just select the correct project first and I run the tests, we can see that user story one has already been passed. This is very so let's look at user story two now. And what it says is my core plots should have a description with ID of description. So this is very simple again. It's very similar to the last time. You just create an element and you just give it the ID of description like this. And then you just put some text inside it. So I'm just gonna put percentage of people over 25 with a bachelor's degree again this does the text inside really doesn't matter so I'm just gonna put the source there as well the text inside really doesn't matter all you need to do is create a, an element with an ID of description like this and if we look now we have this description right here and we have an element here with an ID of description so if I just run the test user story 2 has been passed so now what we're going to do is actually create the map on our canvas. And this is where we'll be fulfilling user story three. So what it says is my core plots should have counties with a class of county that represent the data. So we're gonna be making use of this county data array of GeoJSON objects to do this. So this is a little bit tricky, but um, I hope it's all right to understand. So we're working with the draw map method now. So this is where we'll be drawing our maps. And we want to run this once we've imported all the data. So when the last piece of data right here has been imported, we want to run the draw map method like this. So first thing I'm going to do is make a selection on canvas. So I'm going to say canvas dot select. So it's a D3 selection. And remember that I said that each of these states right here is an SVG path element because it's a set of lines that draw the shape of the state. So we're going to select all parts and then we're going to call the dot data method and give it this county data array. So what we've done is any parts on the canvas, we've associated it with one of these GeoJSON objects right here. Then I'm going to call the enter method and what this means is we're going to specify what to do when there is a GeoJSON object for a county that doesn't have a path which is all of these in this case and what we want to do then is we want to create a new path so I'm going to append and then append a new path now this is the important path part so an SVG um, path has an attribute called a D, which we need to set. So I'm going to call the attribute method on this new path and set D. And what D is, D is a set of like coordinates or lines that are actually needed to draw the path on the canvas. And since we've associated with this data method, we've associated each of the paths with one of these GeoJSON objects, we can call a D3 method right here. So where we return a value, I'll say D3.GeoPath. So this is the method we call GeoPath. And what GeoPath does is it converts this, I guess, this geometry or whatever into a set of, in, into like a string that can be given to the SVGD attribute and an SVG can use that to draw the path we need. Finally, I'm going to set the class attribute to, what was it that they wanted? County. So I'm going to set the class to county. And I've just realized I mis misspelled to that there. So what we've done is, is we've selected all the parts, we've associated it with, with the array of GeoJSON objects, we've specified what to do when there isn't a path, and we said to create a new path, and we set the D attribute, which is the data that the SVG uses to draw the path, and we've called the D3GeoPath method 
which converts that GeoJSON object into a path that SVG can use. And finally, we set the class of the path to county. Sorry, I needed to select all paths here. This should be a select all right here. And now look, we've actually got the map imported right here. So what it's done is we've used D3 to sketch out a path for each of the county GeoJSON object in the array and it set the fill to black but we'll mess with that later but we've essentially drawn the map so this is the hard path it's the hard part done and out of the way now and this should be user story 3 completed because if we have a look at the canvas right now we have all of these parts that have a class of county and then look this is the path data right here but we don't need to understand it really so if I run the test now we can see that user story 3 has passed because we have these elements with the class of county. So yeah, I hope you understood all. So now what we're going to be doing is looking at changing the colors of these uh, county objects right here. And this is where we'll be fulfilling user story four, which says there are at least four different fill colors that are used for the counties. So we're gonna be setting the fill attribute. So we have already the created parts and the selection so we can just set the fill attribute like this and um, remember the fill attribute we can give it a function that takes in one of the items from this array county data array right here so i'm just going to call this county data item like this and we'll remember that county data items are these geojson objects right here so what we want to do is return different colors based on this percentage of adults with a bachelor degree or higher as they've done right here. And this information is not actually in the GeoJSON object, unfortunately, because all that does is tell us how to draw the shape onto the canvas. But remember that they do have an ID right here. That's like the ID of the state. And what we can do with that ID is we can match a a, a county on this uh, education data object that has the same FIPS code. Sorry, I meant to say um, county earlier, not state. So we can match a county from this array that has the same FIPS code and get the education data from here. So the first step is to select a county from here that matches the FIPS code of the GeoJSON item. So I'm going to say let and I'm going to say ID equal county data item ID. So we've selected the GeoJSON ID and then put it into this ID field right here. Then I'm gonna call, I'm gonna, we're gonna select the correct county from this array of counties right here in the education data. And I'm gonna use the array find method. So I'm gonna call the find method on the county, uh, sorry, on the education data array. And I'll say dot find. And what we what in find what we do is we give it a function that returns a boolean expression, and then what the find method does is it returns the first object that where that boolean expression is true. And remember, we're trying to match the county where the FIPS code is equal to our ID. So we'll say that item FIPS. Remember, this item refers to an item in the education data object and the count this id right here is the id of the geojson object so we want to make sure the fips code actually i'll return this we want to make sure the fips code is equal to the id and now this is set county to be the correct county object finally we want to get the actual data we want and the data is the percentage of people who have bachelors or higher. And that's stored in this field called bachelors.higher in each of the county. So remember we selected the county right here. So we can just say let percentage equals and then county like this. And then we can select the bachelors or higher field. And now what we're going to do is return different colors based on this percentage. So I'm gonna say if percentage if percentage is less than or equal to, and these numbers are just chosen by me, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm gonna say if it's less than 15% of adults, we want to return um, tomato 
um, again, these colors don't really matter. We just have to return different colors. Else if, so if the percentage is between 15 and 30, so percentage is less than or equal to 30, um, I'm going to return, I'm going to return orange here. And remember, we have to do four colors. So next I'm going to see if it's between 30 and um, 45. So less than or equal to 45. Um, I'm going to return maybe light green. And then else, so it means that more than 45 um, percent of people have a bachelor's degree or higher and we can just return a darker green so I'll return lime green here. So what this does is it selects the um, object from the education data array to match the county and then it looks at the percentage of people who are bachelors or highest and depending on this percentage value it returns different colors. So if we look at our map now, we can see that we have the states in different colors depending on the bachelor's or highest field. And if we look at our elements right here, we can see that the paths have different fill colors. So we've got at least four different fill colors here, and that's all we really need to pass this test. So if I run the test now, we can see that user story 4 has been completed now. So let's look at doing user story five now. And what it says is we should have a data FIPS and data education properties or attributes on each of our counties. And they have to represent the FIPS and education values. By education value, they just mean the percentage value that we got earlier. So we have a set of these attributes on the counties. So I'm gonna call the attribute method here. And the first one is data FIPS. And remember these, um, these uh, take in a function that take in one of the items in the array. So in this county data array right here. So if we take in county data item, the FIPS code, remember that I said is exactly equal to the ID of the GeoJSON objects in the county data array. So we can just return the ID. So I'm just gonna return county data item ID like this. Next one is the data education attribute. So again, I'll call the attribute method. And this time the attribute is data education. And this time, uh, again, we have to do a function that takes in an item from the county data array. So get call it county data item just to avoid confusion. And this time we want to select the object that has the same ID as the FIPS, same FIPS code as the ID from the G, from this array, and then return the bachelor's or higher field for that. This is very similar to the code that we used to um, change the color based on the percentage. So I'm just going to sh uh, copy and paste this and then just tell you what happens. So we set the ID from the count, so from the county data item. So we have the this geojson object and we set id to just this id right here and then we look at the um education data so we look at education data array and we return the first object where the fips code right here is equal to that id so we call the find method and we give it a function with a boolean expression and so the Boolean expression is that the FIPS code matches the ID and it returns the first object where that holds true. So that's this county right here. And then what we just, just did was set the percentage to equal the bachelor's or highest field, which is where the actual percentage is stored. So the last thing we just need to do here is simply just to return the percentage like this. If we save that now and have a look, um, and if I open the canvas, we can see that each of these county parts now has the data education with the percentage and then the data FIPS with the FIPS code like this. So if I run the test now, we can see that user story five has now been passed. 
So let's take a quick peek at user story six now. And what it says is that we should have a county for each data point. And we already did this when we ran the enter and append path method. So what we did was we associated the paths with the county data GeoJSON objects. Then we called enter to specify what to do when we don't have a path. And we created a new path and gave it the path attribute with the D3 geo path and we set the class right here. So if you want a reminder of that, you can go back to where we did user story three. And this user story, all it wants you to do is just make sure there's a county object for each state. So we've already completed that. And if we have a look, user story six has already been completed. Now, if we take a quick look at user story seven, what it says is that data FIPS and data education values have to match the sample data. So when we did user story five, we set the data FIPS to return the ID and the data education to return the percentage right here. So if you wanna know how we did that, just go back to user story five. And yeah, again, that one has also been completed because if we look at our elements, we can see that the parts have a data FIPS with the correct um, county ID and the data education with the correct percentage value. So yeah, user story seven has also been completed. So now let's look at user story eight now. And what it says is that we should have a legend with an ID of legend. So that's just this part here that tell you what all the colors mean. So this user story eight itself is not that difficult. All we have to do is anywhere in the document, just create an SVG element with an ID of legend. And it has to be SVG because we have to, in the later user stories, we have to set the fill attribute and fill can only happen with SVG. So we have to create an SVG with an ID of a legend like this. So this will contain our legend. So if I save this now and have a look, we can see that we've passed user story eight now. So now let's look at user story nine. What it says is that we have to have, so since we set the fill colors here to at least four different fill colors, we have to have at least four different fill colors in our legend, which where we specify what the colors mean. And the easiest way to do this is in your SVG legend area is just to create four rectangle elements with the like, um, with the fill colors that you used for your map. Now what I've just done is I've just done a little bit more here, but Again, it doesn't matter. All you need is these four rectangles with the fill equal to the different fill colors that we used. What I've just done is I've created some rectangles and I've, and I've also added some text next to them just to specify um, what they actually, like what the um, colors actually mean. So if I save this now, I had to tweak these X and Y values a lot to get it to look somewhat decent. We have this key or legend right here. and just because we have these rectangles with at least four different fill colors, that will pass user story nine now. There we go. Okay, so let's look at completing user story 10 now. What it says is that we can mouse over a county and we see a div with the ID of tooltip that displays more information. So this is very similar to the tooltips in all the previous projects. So I'm going to be a bit more quick probably about the way I go about this because I've covered it in enough detail already. So the first thing we're going to do is create a div with the ID of tooltip in our document. This is where we'll contain the tooltip information. And remember that we only want to show this when the mouse is over a county. So we want to set the um, default visibility of this tooltip to be hidden. So to do this, I'm going to say tooltip, and I'm going to set the visibility attribute to hidden like this. And I'm also going to set the height and width to auto, but I don't think we need to really do this. So that's the tooltip created. So we have a div with an ID of tooltip that has been generated right here. So yeah, I've just restarted it now because it was being slow and we have this div with the ID of tooltip that's hidden. So next thing I'm going to do is um, where I selected the canvas, I've just selected the tooltip right here. And it what it does is just a D3 selection of this div ID equals tooltip. And now we can reference this tooltip with the variable name tooltip. 
Then um, we want the tooltip to show when we put our mouse over one of these counties. So this is a selection for the county where we set all the attributes. So what I'm going to do is set an event listener here. So it's going to be a mouse over event listener. And what this does is it takes in one of the items in the array and the array we're working with is this county data right here. So this is the array of GeoJSON objects and we take in one of the elements from this array. And what we want to do is we first want to show the tooltip. So I'm going to call the transition method to change the style of the tooltip so like this transition. And what I'm going to do is set this visibility attribute using the style method. So I'm going to say visibility um, to visible. So what this will do is when we put our mouse cursor over the counties, the tooltip becomes visible. Don't know why it's being so slow, but we'll come back to it. So the next thing to do now is to set the actual text of the tooltip to get the information we need. But most of the information we need is actually contained within the um, education data array. So what we need to do is get the county from the education data array. And I'm just going to copy this out. So this is the same thing that we've been doing for the past couple of attributes that we've been setting. So what we just do is we find the object from the education data array that has the same FIPS code as this ID right here. And then we've selected that and then set that to this county. So now we have the county, which is one of our education data array things. And what I'm going to do is, since we're setting the text, which is what goes between the divs, I'm going to call the d3.text method on the tooltip. So I'm going to say tooltip.text. And I'm just going to put set some text properties here. And I'm what I've done is we have this county object, so I've just set it to display the FIPS code, then the area name, then the state, and then the percentage of um, the percentage of people who have bachelors or highest there, and then just a percentage sign like this. The final thing we need to do now is to make sure it disappears when we move our mouse out of it. So uh, I'm going to create another event um, called mouse out and Again, it's a county data item we're dealing with here. This doesn't really matter. And all we want to do is when we move the mouse out of this state, we just want to set this back to hidden. So we want to set the visibility back to be hidden. Um, if you think this is a bit quick, um, I've explained this so many times now, this tooltip thing. So if you watch the bar chart video, I explain the tooltip in a lot of detail. So when we put our mouse over it, we make it visible, and then we set this text right here. And then when we move our mouse out of it, we make it invisible again. So now we can see that when we put our mouse over these counties, we can see that the div IDs tooltip suddenly becomes visible and we have this information right here along the top. So if I uh, run the test now, we can see that the first tooltip test or user story 10 has now been completed. So the next thing we need to do is user story 11 and what it says is that we should have the data education property in the tooltip that is the same as the data education of the active area. So if we go back to this, when we put our mouse cursor over the tooltip, we want to set the data education attribute of the tooltip. So we'll just say tooltip dot and then call the attribute method. And the attribute we want is the data education like this. And We've already got the county right here to work with, and we've already um, rendered the edu data education actually as this percentage right here. So data education is just that percentage. And if we look at how we return this, this is just the bachelor's or highest field from the county. So what we can do is we've already have this county created, which is selection of the um, county object from the education data for the county we're pointing at and we can just return the bachelor's or highest field from there. So I'm just going to copy and paste this into here. And if I save that now and we take a look at this, we can see that this data education field right here now shows the actual percentage that's displayed up here. So we set the data education field of the tooltip now. So if I run the test again, 
Sometimes it doesn't work the first time, so we might have to just refresh it and try again. Um, it should be correct though. Yeah, so we can see that we have all the tests passing. I don't know what, I think it was being glitchy over there. So that's all the 11 user stories that have now been completed. And we've got this fully functional Choropleth map. What I'm gonna do now is just go ahead and just, you know, do some styling to make it look a little bit better. So what I've just done now is I've just applied some CSS styling. I've reorganized things a little bit just to put them into divs just to position them. But none of this code, I haven't touched this script code at all. And if I just have a look now, well, what, what I've done is I've just changed the colors a bit. Um, I've put the legend here, right here. Um, I think it looks a lot better actually, in my opinion. Again, we have the tooltip showing right here right here so that's not changed i've also added a um hover attribute to county to make it black whenever we put our mouse cursor over so we know exactly which state we are looking at um the legend is still there every the description is still there uh none of the functionality should have changed so what i'm gonna just do is i'm if i just run the test we can see that it fully passes still and everything is still functional. Um, if you want to know how I just did, if you want to get the style sheet or just um, want to follow along to any of this, what I'll do is I'll just put the source code in the description so you can download it. So yeah, thank you for watching.